Firing the 14-inch guns on Battleship Texas was an exercise in controlled violence that required sophisticated understanding and application of metallurgy, chemistry, design, and manufacturing processes. While the video is about this ship's 14-inch guns, there's little difference in general design and process between them, the 10-inch 40 caliber guns used on the early 1906 Tennessee-class cruisers, and the big Iowa-class 16-inch 50 caliber guns built almost 40 years later. They incorporated the same basic materials and techniques with improvements that were mainly evolutionary. Let's take an inside look at the steps that were required to load and fire the big guns. Here's a cross section of one of them in the battery position, ready for loading. Notice that the gun barrel has multiple layers that are the main feature of built up construction. This method not only makes it possible to achieve high levels of precision, it also creates a barrel that is far stronger than one made from a single forged casting. Inside of it, we can see the powder chamber and the beginning of the rifled bore. The breech plug has been swung open and the loading tray dropped into place to provide a ramp for loading a shell and powder bags. If you have a close eye, you will see that there is a problem with the illustration. The breech plug is hinged vertically so that it swings up and out of the way. No ship ever used this configuration. In fact, those on Texas swung horizontally, but we did it this way to more clearly show the process. With the breech open, the gun captain inspects the bore and if it's safe he calls bore clear and with that a shell is rammed into the breech using an electric rammer. Notice that the diameter of the powder chamber is larger than the rifled bore and that it also tapers down at two points. The first taper is called the centering slope that starts lining the shell up with the bore as it is rammed so that it doesn't strike and damage the rifling as it's pushed home. The second taper is called the compression slope. Let's closely look at some really important details as the shell rams home. Notice that while its nose extends into the bore's rifling, it doesn't touch it. In fact, to reduce friction, none of the shell's body ever touches the bore of the barrel. The gray band, called the borelette, forms a slight bulge to create a bearing surface for the front of the shell that rides on the surface of the bore's rifling. Near the base of the shell is the copper alloy driving band that serves as the rear bearing surface. It also performs three other important functions. As the shell is rammed, the slope on the band's forward edge hits the powder chamber compression slope to center the shell as it reaches its final position. Behind the taper are three bands or ridges whose diameters are slightly larger than the rifling. Because of that, when the shell is fired and the bands contact the rifling, it cuts into and grabs the bands in an action called engraving. The spiral cut rifling then forces the shell to spin as it moves through the bore. The third feature is a flare that forms a skirt at the rear of the band that is slightly larger than the bore. When the shell is rammed, the skirt jams tightly into the chamber's compression slope. This locks the shell in place so that it doesn't slide back against the powder bags when the barrel is elevated. It also forms a seal at the back of the shell that acts as a gas check to prevent high-velocity superheated gases from shooting around and past the shell when it is fired. The next step is to ram four 105-pound powder bags called sections to provide a 420-pound charge. With the bags in place, the breech plug is closed and locked by the plug man. Once all of the gun crew is in safe positions, he inserts a primer and closes the firing lock. This makes the gun ready to fire, so he moves his safe ready switch to the ready position, signaling the gun pointer and the turret commander that the gun is ready to aim. Seeing the lit ready light, the gun pointer elevates the barrel to vertically align it with the firing solution provided by main battery plotting room. He then flips his switch to the ready position. Once the turret commander sees lit ready lights from both turret barrels, he flips his switch to notify main battery plotting room that the turret is ready. Once all designated turret ready lights are lit, a firing key on the stable element in the room is closed and the device activates the firing circuit the moment it senses that the ship is perfectly level. At this point, things happen very rapidly within our barrel. The closed firing circuit sends a 30 volt current through an almost microscopic nichrome wire in the primer that flashes white hot. The heat sets off a small one ounce black powder charge in the primer. Its flame shoots through the primer vent in the breech plug and strikes the back of the rear powder bag in the chamber. However, it isn't hot enough to reliably ignite the smokeless propellant in the bag. To boost the effect, the small flame strikes a 10 ounce black powder charge located in the red ignition patch sewn onto the back of every powder bag. This readily ignites and produces more than enough energy to set off the main charge. In an almost immeasurably short period of time, the first bag ignites and chamber pressure starts to build. 
As the remaining bags ignite, pressure increases against the back of the shell and its gas check. This forces the 1,500 pound shell forward and its borelette easily slides on the rifling. As it continues to move forward, the three ridges on the driving band are forced into the rifling where they are engraved and grabbed so that the spiraled rifling forces the shell to rotate as it continues its trip through the bore. At this point, chamber pressure has reached its maximum of 36,000 pounds per square inch. Even though they are precisely machined to closely engage one another, the threads in the breech plug and screw box that contains it cannot restrain the superheated high pressure gases and they will shoot past the plug and into the gun house where they will injure the gun crew. However, there is an assembly called an obturator that prevents that. The obturator is a mushroom shaped assembly with a head and a stem that mounts in the breech plug. When the gun fires, pressure pushes the mushroom head back to compress a pad mounted between it and the face of the plug. This pad, made from canvas, asbestos, and tallow, compresses and swells to fill the space between the plug and the gun breech, thus forming a seal that keeps gases from leaking past it. The shell leaves the muzzle of the gun at about 2700 feet per second and bore pressure explosively drops. The obturator rebounds to its original position and temperature also drops as a result of decompression, but the surface of the bore and gases that remain in it are still heated to several hundred degrees. The gun is lowered back to battery position, but it's not ready to open. This is because smokeless propellant has a bad feature. The oxidizer portion of its chemistry does not contain enough oxygen to completely consume all of the fuel produced during combustion. Because of that, the superheated gases still in the bore are extremely flammable. All it takes is fresh air rushing in when the breech plug is opened for them to ignite and flash into the turret where it can injure or even kill the crew. This is where the gas ejector system comes into play. As the breech plug starts to rotate and unlock, an air valve is tripped that shoots compressed air through the breech threads and into the bore. This immediately ignites any unburned gases and pushes them along with any remaining bag fragments out of the muzzle. Air continues to blast through the bore once the plug is fully opened. It's only after the gun captain peers through the open breech and barrel to confirm that it is clear that he turns the valve off, yells out bore clear, and reloading begins. Let's recap what just happened. A small 30 volt electrical current caused a tiny wire inside the primer to flash white hot and start a chain of events that lasted only 55 thousandths of a second. During that brief period, burning propellant instantly created 5,000 degree ignition gases and pressures of up to 36,000 pounds per square inch that pushed against the 1,500 pound shell. Within the 52 foot length of the barrel, the shell accelerated from zero to more than 1,500 miles per hour while spinning at 5,500 RPM. Seconds after being fired, the barrel was lowered, reloaded, and fired again, and the cycle was repeated time and time again. Now think about the fact that the level of metallurgy, chemistry, and engineering required to accomplish this feat was developed over a period of less than 10 years, more than 100 years ago. These guys were really smart. So there's the Reader's Digest version of the process that just scratches the surface. We will soon follow up with some new videos that detail gun barrel design and construction, projectiles, powder and powder bags, and even primers and firing locks.